Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video. Slightly different video today because I have a guest with me today. This is Marissa from Blatantly Bookish and we're going to be talking about The Odd Women, which we hosted a read-along of earlier this month. This is the second half of the video, as it were. We're about to have a big spoilery discussion about The Odd Women, so if you want to hear our non-spoilery thoughts about the book, then head over to Marissa's channel where we've also made a video. I'll link that down in the description and the cards and you can go over and watch that to hear our thoughts without spoilers. But if you haven't read the book i wouldn't recommend sticking around for this video because we are going to be having a big in-depth discussion with a lot of lot of spoilers there's <laughs> lots of exciting things about the odd women to discuss so in terms of the ending when i first read the book the first time i found the ending to rhoda's plot line incredibly satisfying the ending to monica's much less so but i don't think i necessarily feel that as much this time i think i found the overall ending more satisfying on a second reading but i'd be interested to know what you think about that as well i feel like there are two endings in a way like monica and rhoda's plot lines are interweaved but they're also quite separate for a lot of the book um and therefore the endings to them feel a bit a bit separate as well yeah absolutely so there's definitely two endings to the book and i actually found them both dissatisfying um when reading it i really i don't know why i was rooting for it but i wanted rhoda and mr barfoot to get together and get married in the end. And I don't know why I wanted that because it's so incredibly problematic to want that. I think their ending was the way it should have been, but I think I'm so conditioned to expect a marriage plot at the end. And I'm just so conditioned to, it's a Victorian novel, it's going to end in a happy marriage. And it just didn't. Um, and then obviously Monica's plot is just so tragic at the end. I didn't care for it but again i see why it was done and i think even though i disliked the endings i know why they were there i know why they happened and when i really think about them they should be satisfying yeah. but they're not for me i'm so glad that rhoda and everard don't end up together because i think one because i think that's what this like her story requires um and because i think actually they wouldn't work together. It's very complicated, you know, we were talking about this while we were reading it, is, is Rhoda in love with Everard or not? Um, because I think she sort of is, but she also sort of isn't. I think she's really attracted to Everard and I think she likes him and they like, she finds him interesting intellectually. But I think the fact that she sort of doesn't really trust him and the fact that when their relationship is tested and they're sort of a reasonable excuse for her to get out of it. She doesn't want it back as much as she might have done. Rhoda feels strongly towards Everard, but she kind of wants a reason not to marry him because she doesn't really want to marry. There's a bit where she talks as well about the letter from Mary Barfer um, accusing Everard of possibly being um, in a messy relationship with Monica, where Rhoda says later to Everard that it was an unlucky chance or maybe a lucky chance. And I think she sort of feels like they've escaped each other and maybe that's for the best, which I sort of think is right. It would have always been too awful if she'd have married him when she wants to prove that a life can be very worthwhile without marriage. And I think that's what she does prove. And it's important for the book that she doesn't marry him to kind of prove that, I guess. But I think you are sort of supposed to both want and not want them to end up together because of the connection they do have and because in a different Victorian novel they would be together. Yeah, and I think that's important that we do both simultaneously want them to get together and don't want them to get together. Because as much as I was hoping for them to get married in the end, I look back on that and I think, why? Why would I want them to be married? I don't think that their marriage would last. I don't think either of them would be happy in it ultimately. And I don't think that they're suited for each other ultimately but here I am wanting to, them to get married. And I think that that just raises all of these problems in Victorian literature and in the society at the time, this drive towards marriage. And I like that Rhoda kind of proves that drive wrong and makes the reader really evaluate that want and that desire for her to end up with a happy marriage. I think one of the reasons why we kind of both want and don't want Rhoda and Everard to get together is partly because Everard is a really fully fledged and interesting character even though like sometimes he says things and I'm like I really disapprove of you but also he feels very human and you sort of like him he is very charming both to Rhoda and to the reader and also I think like that scene 
on the beach he's so powerful and so well done like i think the two bits i remembered so vividly from my first reading were mary barfoot's um like speech to the typewriting school about um like women's rights and the scene between Rhoda and everard on the beach where he asked her to marry him um because it is really really charged and you do get the sense that there is a really strong emotional connection between them even if it's quite a complicated one yeah and they just have such a complicated relationship because they're both complicated characters i think and their love for each other is fleeting and not really based on a solid foundation of trust and on maybe honesty but not trust i think as well like both of them their love for each other is bound up with a lot of pride like everard kind of goes into flirting with her because he kind of wants to prove that he can make her love him um and she kind of her vanity is flattered because she has been single all her life and no one's ever shown interest in her really even before she thinks that she might marry him she wants to bring him to the point of asking her to marry him because she like feels that that's important to her pride to know that she has kind of had that effect on someone um and there's an interesting bit like during the proposal that basically everard wants them to be married legally but he first offers um them to live together outside of marriage because he wants to test her and Rhoda would actually be quite happy with and possibly would prefer living with him outside of marriage but she wants to make to make him ask her to marry him legally because she wants him to prove himself in that way so they're both sort of at cross purposes they're still kind of having an intellectual competition even while their proposal's going on I think so and I think also part of that intellectual competition is Rhoda wants him to want to marry her she wants to be able to have that choice to be able to say no to prove that she's even more adherent to her ideals in some way and then monica's plot line i think is is very difficult because the ending is really tragic the first time i read it i found it really disappointing and i was really angry that monica died and even though i still loved the book and thought it was incredible i felt like that was the wrong narrative choice whereas rereading it now i don't not sure that i do feel that in quite the same way And I think there's something quite powerful about the the fact that it kind of ends with Alice Madden, who it began with, and Alice and Virginia, even though they're not that important throughout the novel, what happens in the novel affects their lives forever and makes their lives better in a way, I suppose, because they can raise Monica's child. And Alice sort of finds that as a a mother to um, her niece, actually, she's going to have a better life. And that's a role that actually she likes. Yeah, I definitely like the end caps of Alice and Virginia and seeing the vast changes in their life over the course of the book. Um, but I was I was still disappointed at Monica's death. I feel like there was a better narrative structure for it and sh- there was a way for her to not have to die in the end. But in terms of yeah. having this take place in Victorian society, having her die was probably the right move because, I mean, in my opinion, I would love for the book to have ended with Monica living apart from Mr. Widowson for a while, then Mr. Widowson dying and Monica gaining this freedom and this new place in society. But I think that would have been too much of a risk and too much of a problem for Gissing to actually portray in the book. I think by having her die at the end, some readers would condemn her for her actions and that's sort of her punishment in the end or that's one way of reading it maybe if you're Victorian to have it kind of even out and be a little less a little less subversive that way and a little more palatable to the Victorians at the time um, if that was one way of reading it which I think it is but it's not my preferred way of reading it of course. Yeah I think there are like two other ways of reading it and one is that Monica is killed by the narrative or Gissing kills her because she doesn't fit into either ideal she doesn't fit into the Victorian ideal that Mr. Widowson has of this angel in the house she's not that but she also doesn't fit into Rhoda's ideal because she doesn't she, you know, she wants to get married and she doesn't want to live a life alone. That almost, guessing can't handle that. Or um, Victorian society can't handle that. That at this point in Victorian society, you're either a new woman and you're independent and you reject everything about traditional Victorian femininity or womanhood, or you're an angel in the house. And to be something in between is just not really, that's not really accepted. 
Um, so I think that's one reason why like Monica dies is because she doesn't fit into either school. And then I think the other reason why is because there isn't a happy ending for women in that situation in the Victorian period. The first time I read it, I thought the first thing and it annoyed me. And the second time I read it, I feel like I thought actually maybe the reason why Gissing chose to kill Monica at the end is because there isn't a happy ending in the Victorian world she lives in for a woman in her situation. She's been in an abusive marriage um, and she leaves her husband, but her reputation is ruined and she's having a child, but she's not living with the father of the child and her husband has been so awful to her. And if you're a woman like that and that's the situation in the Victorian period, maybe there just isn't a happy ending for you because society is so rubbish. So I feel like if that's the point that Gissing is trying to make, then I like it, if you see what I mean. That's true. I feel like... If she had lived, I would have hoped she would have lived kind of outside society in sort of a more rural area with her sisters and just not interact with too many people. But I mean, she would have had to. And you're right. She would have been looked down upon, certainly, in that situation. One thing I do like about the ending is that Monica's child is a girl. Um, One, because I think there's a suggestion that Alice and Virginia and Rhoda will all kind of raise her to be an independent and a strong woman um, who will be, who will live in a, a new age in a way. But also because the fact she is a girl means that within kind of Victorian ideas, um, her father is much less likely to be involved in her life. Um, I feel like if Monica had given birth to a boy, Mr. Widowson would have been more likely to have a role in that child's life. Whereas I think because it's a girl, he will probably not. And this girl will be raised by her aunts um, and her mother's friends there's that really lovely bit at the end where um yeah i love that bit i know what you're gonna read (laughs) alice is talking to rhoda about the school and she says about um monica's child here is one people growing for us make a brave woman of her said rhoda kindly we will try oh we will try and then rhoda talks about how this like the typing school is improving um, and she says the world is moving and i think you get a sense that like hopefully the world Monica's daughter grows up in will be a different world and that child is not going to live the life that Monica has led, which I think is a really nice, hopeful ending. Although I still think the fact yeah. that the like, last few words of the book are poor little child kind of slightly undo the hope and make me think maybe it won't be happy because the world is still a mess. Yeah, I think, I think that it's a hopeful ending, but with the acknowledgement that poor little child, you've, you've lost your mother, but also it's going to be difficult for you. Even in a new world, it's still going to be a struggle to be one of these new women. And there's something kind of sad about that, but also still kind of hopeful. Yeah, it's sort of like a tempered, realistic hope, isn't it? There's a rational hope for the future, but also an acknowledgement that the future's going to be tough. Even though she's a poor little child, I think she's actually quite lucky to have Rhoda and Alice in Virginia, um, even though she doesn't have her mother or her father. It's better that she doesn't have her father, to be honest. (laughs) Yeah, Mr. Widdowson's a really interesting character. um, Somewhat terrifying, but also, I think, very believable and complicated as well. Yeah, um, I was absolutely horrified when reading about Mr. Widdowson. Really, from his introduction, um, their original meeting rubbed me the wrong way somehow. Even my modern sensibilities felt that it was improper the way they met Mm. and that their whole relationship was just kind of doomed from the get-go. Their relationship sort of comes about because they're both lonely um, and they're both sort of desperate for a future, but they're not the right people for each other's future and they can't see that because they don't have anyone else or anywhere else. Yeah, absolutely. And they're both looking for something that the other one has or they think they have, but in reality, they don't. Mm. Um, I think Mr. Widowson brings Monica financial security and um, society, not that she ever really craved society in some ways because his relationship with Mrs. Luke. um, But again, he tries to keep her away from Mrs. Luke and everyone else. So in reality, it turns into a financially I think it's prison yeah and I think as well like Monica hates her job at the Drapers and she thinks that if she marries she will have a kind of like a freedom from work but of course she doesn't have any freedom at all when she marries Mr. Widowson because he resents any independence from her um, and what he wants from her is an ideal Victorian idea of a wife um, an angel in the house figure not the human woman that he gets and I think there's a really fantastic bit where Gissing writes sort of 
one of the sort of problems for Mr. Widdowson is that he has been brought up to see women as pets, not to see women as human. But he marries a woman who, but her very being kind of asserts her right to be considered a human. So Mr. Widdowson has to consider her a human, but he doesn't know how to understand women as equal humans to him because that's not how his world has taught him. That part was particularly fascinating. And I think that in some ways, because Monica uh, asserted herself a little bit in the relationship and was trying to show Mr. Widdowson that she did want to be a little more independent and that she didn't necessarily completely agree with his ideas of marriage, it forced him in some ways to become more aggressive than he otherwise would be in a relationship. Like I could see Mr. Widdowson in a relationship married with just an average Victorian woman who was not perhaps exposed to Rhoda Nunn. And it would have been an unpleasant marriage, but nothing like the way Monica and Mr. Widdowson's marriage turned out to be. I don't think he would have been quite so abusive in another relationship. I think one of the interesting things about Mr. Widdowson is that he is very much a product of his time and his age. Um, both in the sense that he is sort of the way he's been brought up to, to think of women, but also in the sense that he's sort of reactionary to Monica and to Monica's changing ideas because he can't handle the idea that um, kind of gender relations are changing at this point in time. Um, and also I think there's the implication that sort of lots of men within the Victorian period being brought up in the system could become Mr. Widowson um, because Mr. Widdowson has been brought up to kind of expect basically certain behavior from his wife. That is how he thinks women and wives should be. And that is not what Monica is. Um, And he just can't handle that. And I think he's an interesting character because he is quite human and you do get a good look inside his head and you do get to see his psyche. And you also see that he is miserable, but he's also terrifying and awful as well. Yeah, I think in many ways he represents the traditional Victorian ideal of manhood and marriage and even though he's a bit older um that even helps to emphasize how he represents sort of an older view of victorian society and even though he does represent that he has all these little nuanced ideas and and notions he realizes that monica doesn't adhere to what he's learned, even though he realizes that, and he even thinks that they shouldn't be together. There's one point where he says, well, if divorce was a thing, I would divorce her. Um, We shouldn't be together. Um, But the society's constrictions doesn't allow for that, and the way he's been brought up doesn't allow for that. And in the end, it just makes him miserable and not adaptable to change and not adaptable to acknowledging either that they shouldn't be together or that they should be together in a different way. Neither of those is a possibility for him. And so what ends up happening is just miserable and frankly abusive. I think it's interesting as well because Mr. Widowson is always incredibly possessive. But I think also because he then finds out that Monica has lied to him, he sort of feels that all of his behavior has been therefore entirely justified, um, which sort of makes him much worse. And I think it's interesting because we kind of understand how Monica gets into that situation. It is interesting that Monica got into the situation because of his lack of trust, and then she ends up betraying his trust because he had so little trust of her in the first place that she feels like she has to lash out, where otherwise, if he had just trusted her and been honest with her and a little less possessive, she would have never lashed out in the first place. She would have never done something like interact with Mr. Bevis, Bevis, Bevis in the way that she does. The only way she knows how to sort of show her independence from her husband, the only way she at first thinks that she can leave her husband is with another man. Um, And that's sort of still weirdly within kind of Victorian social constraints. And what Rhoda might urge her to do, which would be to leave her husband and and live alone independently. Um, Monica can't quite get her head around that. Um, And the way to kind of assert her independence over her husband is to find another man. Um, And she kind of thinks that the problem is not marriage, but her particular marriage and the man she's married. But then when she kind of um, gets to know Mr. Bevis more, she soon becomes disillusioned with him and realizes that he's sort of just messing around with her and he's not serious. And I think that is Gissing saying that it's it's marriage, really, and the particular system of marriage within the Victorian period, rather than um, Mr. Widow 
Watson versus Mr. Bevis, who is necessarily the problem. Absolutely. And I think that it is a really strong critique of marriage. I don't think that there are any particularly happy marriages or successful marriages in the book. I'm trying to think of one. The one is the Micklethwaites, um, Everard's friends. And they're really interesting because, of course. because they are a happily married couple who love each other. But they've known each other for 20 years before they're able to get married because of financial problems. And I think that is like a incredibly like important thing that Gissing's saying because this couple who should get married and who are a good match um one they're a good match because they've known each other a long time and they actually understand each other but also they should have been able to get married sooner but they can't because of class and money whereas Mr Widowson and Monica can get married on an incredibly short acquaintance where they know nothing about each other and they're not suited to each other and I think it's really important that the two weddings take place in the same chapter and they're so incredibly different and they go on to incredibly different marriages. Gissing's view is probably that there are plenty of people who could have a happy marriage and get on well but actually a lot less than do get married and often the people who are able to get married um are not marrying the right people and don't know each other properly yeah and i still think that that's a critique of marriage in and of itself because the micklethwaites yes they're happy and they're happily married but they don't marry for the reasons most people marry they both had separate lives for so long before they get married and they don't achieve anything from the marriage the way that most people do when they go ahead and marry. It's not a mercenary marriage. It's not a marriage of financial security. It's a purely passionate marriage. They married each other because they want to be together. And while that's one motive for marrying, usually it's not an acceptive motive for marrying unless it comes with some of those other benefits to marriage like society or money. Yeah. And I think the fact that the only positive marriage presented to us in the book is one where they've known each other for 20 years is very telling of like what one of the big problems Gissing thinks is within marriage. Just people not knowing each other and not understanding each other. Mr. Widowson doesn't really think of Monica as a human until they're married. And then that thought in itself is troubling to him in a way. Yeah. And in terms of Bevis and Monica, they didn't really know each other either. Monica thought she knew him and thought she understood him. And he thought that he really liked her. But when they really examined their relationship and what they were hoping to get out of it and each other, um, they found that maybe they didn't really know each other so well after all. Mr. Bevis, it turns out, liked the idea of Monica and wanted to be exciting and have an adventure of some sort. But when he really thought about what it meant to absconce with Monica, <laughs> um, it would mean parting with his family, becoming an outcast, disregarding Victorian society altogether. And he wasn't ready for that. That's not what he had intended. He just wanted a little fun. Or maybe he did think he really loved her, but when he realized that these would be the consequences, he didn't quite love her all that much. Yeah, I think Mr. Bevis um, is a a attracted to Monica when she's unavailable, partly because she's unavailable. And then when he realizes that her marriage has come to such a point that she is actually not unavailable in the same way and that she's willing to give up everything and run away with him, that's not what he wants and that's not what he can do. And to live outside society in that way is just beyond him. Yeah, and Monica realizes that when things get serious, he isn't the same person she thought he was, and he doesn't yeah. want the same things that she does. So I think that's all that we wanted to talk about for now. Um, so if you joined in with the read-along, do let us know what your thoughts were um, and how you enjoyed it and what you think of the ending especially is definitely interesting to discuss. Um, definitely go and check out Marissa's channel if you're not subscribed to her. Um, and I think that's all. So thank you very much for watching and I'll be back very soon with another bookish video. Mm -hmm.